I'm Amanda, a product engineer at Gusto. We provide payroll benefits and HR for small and medium-sized businesses. I work on the Gusto Pro team, which is our product for accountants. I've spent a lot of time revamping the accounting firm experience, which has involved discovering better ways to model our domain in GraphQL. Hello, I'm Sophie, also an engineer at Gusto. For most of my time there, I've been working on full stack greenfield feature development, uh, but most recently, I just joined the GraphQL team. So, this is a talk about schema design, because schema design is hard. Uh, unfortunately, a lot of times, we don't even realize a schema design flaw until we're too far committed. Oftentimes, that puts us in the position of a trade-off. Do we fix the schema now, or do we keep going with a bad pattern because we have a feature to deliver? It would be great if we just never built a bad scheme in the first place, right? Well, in our experience working in Gusto Pro, our app for accountants, Amanda and I had to learn some lessons the hard way. Our product is literally a client management tool for accountants. So we had a lot of relational data for our accountants, their clients, their clients' employees. And we know firsthand how much a flawed schema can slow down feature development and even make it easy to introduce bugs. So we've actually come up with some guidelines that help us build a better schema from the start. Those guidelines are ask the domain questions, expose relational data on relational types, and consider multiple query paths. So yeah, that's the talk. OK, I'm going to go back and play with the puppies. <laughs> no, the puppies ended 15 minutes ago. No. <laughs> I guess we can come back and actually convince you of these three guidelines. Yeah. OK, no. So in all seriousness, what we want to do today is walk you through an exercise of incrementally building a schema for a set of product requirements. Our goal is that you'll be able to see some of the mistakes we've made, and then hopefully you can avoid making the same mistakes in your schema. And before we get started, we want to call out that, of course, there's no one-size-fits-all solution. So maybe for your use case, it does make sense to copy your modeling layer into your GraphQL API. But for us at Gusto, most of us are full-stack engineers. So when we fell into the trap of just copying our database into our schema, that left us with a graph that was pretty much useless unless you were already a domain expert. So because we want our graph to power all of our feature development, we want it to be a domain-driven API, and these are the guidelines that have helped us to create that. So with that being said, I'll pass it to Amanda. Imagine we're building an app that people use to track reading and writing books. This app serves readers and authors, and a person can be a reader and an author, so we'll work with the following models, user, author, reader, and book. These models have the following relationships. A user can have an author profile and a reader profile. We're modeling these relationships as one-to-one. -one. An author can write many books, and in this world, a book can only be written by one author. Finally, readers read many books, and books are read by many readers. Here are some basic GraphQL types. As you can see, these types correspond to our models, author, reader, book, and user. We also have book genre, which isn't shown on the page, but we wanted to show you what attributes we might care about. You can see that book genre is actually an enum, uh, as opposed to a string, because this is GraphQL, and we like types. This is an example of where our schema starts to differ from our modeling layer a bit, assuming we're storing genre as a string in the database. So let's take this user type and add an author field to it, because a user can be an author. If we were to build a query like this to get author info, we can visualize that query with a graph, where the edges in that graph represent the field names, and nodes are the types in our schema. Now let's say we add a reader field to user. Then we can visualize the entire schema with this graph. As we build features, we're going to be revisiting this schema graph. Now that we've established some basic types, it's time to build a feature. Throughout the slides, we'll use these git commits to contextualize what we're trying to build. For this feature, we have some product requirements in the form of a user story. As an author, I want to be able to see a list of the books that I've written and the total number of books I've written. Seems very straightforward. Let's go through how we can expose this data we need with GraphQL. We have our author type, and if we want to expose a list of their books, we're going to need to add a books field. Then if we write out our query to show an author's list of books, it looks like this. We can make sure we've met our requirements. Yeah, I, I can see a list of books I've written. We just wrote that query. and. Since the list of books is a list type, we can figure out the total number of books, 
the client can just get the length of the list. So we're good to go. Here's what our schema looks like graphically now. Book and author are directly connected by that new books field. Great, that's pretty simple. But let's be realistic, a uh, list isn't a great type to use, especially if the data can be unbounded, right? So we can do a little bit better here and update this field so that this is actually a paginated list. Authors can write many, many books. So really quick, want to refresh us on the relay specification for cursor-based pagination. There's some additional types that we're going to need. The first one here is a connection type. And the point of this type is to relate one type to a collection of another type. That collection is accessed through this edges field, and that's actually a list of an edge type. And this edge type is what's actually relating those two types. It's representing that individual relationship. The cursor field is used for paginating, but it's through this node field that we actually get access to the type that we care about. A lot of times people think of this edge type as just a wrapper type, and that's true to some extent, right? We're just using this for pagination but we're gonna see how you can use this type for more than just that. Lastly, we also need our page info type, and this just allows us to navigate through that paginated list. Okay, so let's apply this to our domain of authors and books. We're gonna need an author book connection type. This is to connect one author to a list of their books. And we're, this is just a naming convention we're using here. Um, the author book connection just has to end in that word connection. But we're being specific here, saying we're relating one author to many books. So then naturally, our author book edge type here, this is for that same reason we want to communicate we're relating one author to one book. And then lastly, our page info type. So now that we have these types in our schema, we can update our fields. So this is what author looked like before, before this field was paginated, and this is the query. But now that we're using pagination, some things change, right? You can see on our books field, we have these arguments for pagination, and our query looks a little bit different because we have to go through these edge and node types. So if we think about the graphical representation Amanda showed us, uh, this actually isn't true anymore, right? Because this books field is actually giving us an author book connection now. So let's go ahead and update this. We'll follow the schema types. We really have an author book connection here. Well, an author book connection then has an edges field. We add that to our graph. And then an author book edge has that node field, right? So we can add that to our graph as well. And finally, we arrive at our book type. And that's what we care about. But looking at this graph, it's kind of awkward, right? We have a node in this graph called author book edge. And we have an edge labeled node. And that's really awkward. I want to acknowledge that this isn't intuitive. But it is correct. We followed the schema type definitions to build out this graphical representation. So we want to draw attention to this, because when you're thinking about the types in your schema, you might not be thinking of these types in the correct way graphically. A lot of times, we abstract this part of the graph from our mental model. We think, yeah, an author just has a paginated list of books, but not really remembering that there are these additional types powering that. Cool. So now we have pagination. Let's check in and look at our product requirements. We have a list of all the books that we've written. Great. But it's this total here. Now that this list of books is paginated, a client would have to request everything in order to get the total. So it's time to refactor. We want to expose a field for the total number of books so that the client can get the total number of books without querying for every page. Going back to our database, to get the total number of books, we can look at the join table between books and authors. But say we want to denormalize the data, we can store the number of books an author has written uh, so that we don't have to calculate it every time. And it makes sense to store that data on author, right? Now, what does this look like at the GraphQL layer? We can just add a total number of books field. It's a pattern you've probably seen before. It's analogous to what we were doing in the modeling layer. We stored the total on author, so now we're exposing it on the author type. Based on this type, we can write a query to get the list of books and the total number of books. And visualizing this graphically, we see there's another arrow coming out of author now for that, that new total field. This graph shows that as a result of our refactor, in order to get an author's books and the total number of books, a client has to request these two separate fields about book. That's fine, 
but it was nicer before when we were getting everything we needed about book from the books field. Is there a field that the client can use to get the list of books and the total? Well, remember that for paginated lists, the connection type is used for the collection. So what if we use that? We can take total off of author and put it on author book connection instead. And now our types look like this. We can write the query, and you'll notice the total number of books is nested under books. It's nicer. With this change, though, the field name is redundant. The field is on author book connection type, which already tells us that it's about a collection of books. So we can simplify this field name to total. Here's what the type and query look like now. We can look at it graphically. There's the updated graph. The relevant book data for an author is co-located in a type that describes the connection between authors and books. Sort of <laughs> delayed animation there. <laughs> and there is one entry point for all data relating an author and a book, which is convenient. So we finished our requirements now. Earlier, Sophie went over how to get the list, and we just talked about how to get the total. Let's zoom out and remind ourselves what the schema looks like with those pagination changes. Here's our schema now. Instead of that direct connection, it's got the pagination types, and total lives on the connection. For the rest of this talk, we're only gonna show leaf nodes on the graph when they're relevant, so it doesn't get too overwhelming. We have a lot of graphs coming up. <laughs> uh, let's add a similar feature for readers. Um, looks familiar. As a reader, I wanna be able to see a list of all the books I've written and the total, or sorry, that I've read, because I'm a reader, and the total number of books that I've read. Uh, so we're gonna skip, skip a few steps here. We've, we just did the same thing from the author perspective. Say we added a reader type to our user and we added a paginated books field, similar to what we did on the author type. We've got the total field. Uh, we're gonna do what engineers do best and copy a pattern already in our code base. <laughs> so our query to get the readers and the books that they've read looks like this. That takes care of our product requirements. So here's our schema overall again. We can update it so we've got the reader type now too. But wait. Check out these book types on both sides of the graph. It's the same book type. So we'll update the graph to show this. And now we see that whether we go through author or reader, we end up at the same book type. To make the graph clearer, we flipped some parts of it around a bit. This is the graph we're going to be referencing throughout the rest of the exercise. Awesome. Well, we're going to keep building. We're going to keep going. The scheme is looking great. So our next product requirement, as an author, I want to be able to see when I started writing a book and finished writing a book. Plain. <laughs> we can imagine authors are using our app to maybe track their book writing progress, something like that. So back to our modeling layer, this data would naturally live on the join table, right? But if we take a look at the GraphQL query that we already have for this author view that we're building, it looks like this. We have author, we're getting books. So it would make sense to just add those timestamp fields into this query on that book type. So let's make that change. We have our book type here, we add those fields, and looking through our query looks good. We have all the data that we need. So if we look at our graph, it was like this before, but now we have added some fields onto book. Great, seems simple. So we'll keep building. Now we're gonna do a sort of a similar thing for our readers. Again, as a reader, I wanna be able to see when I've started and then finished reading a book. Maybe they're also tracking their progress in our app. So this was the query powering our reader view, very similar to what we just saw with the author. And just like before, it makes sense to just add those fields that we need, right? Started at, finished at. Well, if we look, oh, started at, finished at. <laughs> if we look at our book type, uh, we already have these fields. Perfect, so this works, right? This is exactly what we needed? No, it's not. So we all know, because we just authored that last commit. Oh, author was a horrible word to use there. We just made that last commit, right, for an author. It's their started at and finished at times. So this data isn't actually about the reader at all. It's about the author. So here we know that we did this, but it's easy to imagine a scenario where a developer, another developer is coming in, and they don't realize what this data actually represents, right? So ideally, yes, our fields have descriptions and you know, should be clear, but a query should be readable. And I wouldn't fault someone based on this query for thinking that this data is about a reader. 
So at this point, our schema is a bit ambiguous. These fields are ambiguous, so let's update it. All right, if we rename these fields, we can make them more specific. We can specify that these are the timestamps for when an author started and finished writing the book. It's a longer field name, but it clears up any confusion. So similarly, for our readers fields, we can also specify that this is their timestamps, right? And this is now our query. So a little bit of long field names, but there's no more ambiguity, right? If we look at our graph, we had these ambiguous field names before, but now we have, we have our uh, specific fields for author and reader. Everything is still living on this book type, but we're no longer accidentally susceptible to using the wrong fields. Great, so, so far we've been building author viewing their own data, reader viewing their own data, but now we have a new product requirement for readers to view other readers' data. So you can imagine something like a book club of readers, a group of friends wanna track progress, let's just go with it. So as a reader, I wanna be able to see when other readers started and finished reading books that I've already read, or are reading. So starting from the types in the query that we already had, this was our book type. We had our specific author fields, reader fields, but we can't really use these finished by reader, started by reader, right? It's not specific enough. We can't specify which reader. It's always going to be our own reader data. So what do we do here? Well, we could, if we look at our book type here, we could add an ID field, and that would allow us to specify, but we actually want the list of readers who are reading the same book. So do we take in an ID argument? We could do that, uh, but then we'd have to make a separate query to figure out which reader IDs we need for this. But let's say we go with this. What about this date type? Do we return a list of dates? Do we do some custom type? There's lots of questions here, right? So hopefully you can see that this kind of field is breaking down very quickly. So we've actually come full circle. Schema design is hard. Up until now, everything seemed to made sense until the point that it didn't. <laughs> so let's revisit our three guidelines. Oh, sorry. You're good. <laughs> we don't like that book type. All those fields broke down, right? So it has these long field names. Everything was getting really confusing. But how did it get bad in the first place? What domain questions were we trying to answer when we put all of those fields on that type? Well, <laughs> we wanted to know when an author started and finished writing a book and when a reader started and finished writing a book. Reading a book. Ah, reading the book. <laughs> hey, how many times have we gone Very through confusing. these slides? <laughs> All right, well, we want to keep these domain questions in mind, right? Because these are a hint to us that we're accessing data about both an author in a book and a reader in a book. So let's keep going. Expose relational data on relational types. Our timestamp data between author and book is about the relationship, when it started, when it finished, so we need a relational type that we can put this data on. Well, if we take a look at our schema, it just so happens that we have some relational types that we can use here. See where we're going with all this? <laughs> all right, so last one here, consider multiple query paths. If we look at our graph again, we can see that to get an author's list of books, we go through this path, and then to get a reader's list of books, we go through this path. And this is important because book is accessible through both of these query paths. This is how we ran into all of our problems. We were storing data about an author in a book or a reader in a book on that book type itself. Okay, so we have these three guidelines. I feel like we got a lot of hints about what to do here. Let's go back and fix our schema. Sounds good. I love to fix the schema. <laughs> uh, we'll start with the reader timestamps because that's where things broke in the first place. So let's take those reader timestamps off of book. We'll leave the author timestamps alone for now. Um, we have a connection type, but even though the connection relates a reader to a collection of books, it's not the right type for these timestamps because the timestamps describe the relationship between a reader and one book. We actually need our reader book edge type. We'll put the fields here and the query is straightforward. 
But similar to what we saw with the total number of books field earlier, this field name is redundant. We're already on a reader book type, so we don't need to specify by reader anymore. Here's a reminder of what our schema looked like before this change. We had a bunch of fields on book. Now a few of those are moving to the reader book edge. Now that we've fixed reader timestamps, we can refactor author timestamps similarly. Starting point, timestamps are on book. We move them to the author book edge and simplify the names. So now when we query the author book timestamps, we go through the edges. And this was our schema before. Here's our schema with all of those types moved out to the edges, living on the edge. <laughs> Earlier, we highlighted that whether we go through the author or the reader, we end up at the same book type. Then we saw how complicated it got when we tried to put fields about the relationships on that book type because book is accessible through either query path. Now book only has fields that are purely relevant to book. This is a more intentional schema design. Awesome. Okay, so now that the scheme is cleaned up, we can actually add this feature that we were trying to do, looking at other readers' data, right? So to remind ourselves, we want to be able to see when other readers have started and finished reading books we've read. So looking at our graph here, a reader, we get their list of books through this query path. We've talked about this. But somehow we need to get back to readers. Uh, since we want a list of readers who have read this book, we know we're going to need another connection type. So looking at our types here, we have reader book connection that already exists. But now we're going to add book reader connection. It's just the other direction. So hopefully all of this looks very familiar. You can see our edge has those timestamps on it. We're essentially mirroring what we had before. And so now our query looks like this. We got a lot of stuff going on though. Reader, books, going through those edges and nodes, back to readers. But the important thing here is that because these timestamps are on that book reader edge, we know that these are related to the readers of this book. So let's make sure we're good to go. We can see when other readers have started and finished reading books I've read. Awesome. So looking at our graph overall, this is before we just added that other connection type. Um, we have it here. And you can see we have both connection types. Remember, we started with these database tables. I want to show you how they look in our schema. Here's our one-to-one -one relationships. We have one direct field from user to author and one direct field from user to reader. Then we have our one-to-many relationship between author and books, which goes through a connection type. We don't go directly to the book type. That's a result of following the pagination spec, but it's also valuable to appropriately expose relational data. Finally, we represent the many-to-many -many relationship between readers and books. There's two connection types here, one for each direction getting books a reader has read, and getting readers of that book. We did it. This was obviously a contrived example, but it was inspired by a real situation. In our case, instead of exposing timestamps, we were exposing permissions between an accountant and their clients. The permissions field uh, lived on the client type instead of on the accountant client edge. So when an accountant looked at another accountant's profile to see what permissions they have for their clients, they saw the wrong permission set on the profile. It's similar to a reader being able to view timestamps for other readers, and in our case, we showed the wrong data because our schema design was flawed. From that experience and from this exercise, we have a few learnings. The first one is model fields and schema fields are not the same. They can be, but just because something is stored on a particular table in the database does not mean that you should directly expose it in your schema. We saw this with total number of books in the database. We had it on the author after denormalizing it. But in our schema, it made more sense to store it on our connection type. Instead of just copying how the data is modeled, be intentional about how you expose that data in your schema. We also learned that fields on the wrong type introduce ambiguity into our schema. We saw this when we added those timestamps on the book type. We needed to rename them in order to be more specific about what data those fields were actually returning. And you'll notice we have wrong in quotations here because, of course, you can always get away with specific field names and good descriptions. But that in and of itself is somewhat of a smell, too. Field names like total number of books, 
started by author, they have prepositions in them, of books, by author. And so that's actually telling us through the field name itself that it's not really on the right type. Because without that additional context in the name, you might not know what data that field's returning. So we saw in our exercise too that for those fields, there were better types, the connection and the edge types for those fields to live. Finally, don't rely on query path for schema design. Consider the fact that you can access types from various paths. We saw this when we ran into issues putting fields on book. If the field is on a type, it should belong to that type without needing context of the query path. So really, it's from all of these learnings that we definitely <laughs> learned the hard way in our app. Uh, that's how we derived these guidelines. Model fields aren't schema fields, so we keep that in mind by making sure that we ask the domain questions. The answers to these questions oftentimes gave us a hint about needing a type to relate some types. Next, fields on the wrong type introduce ambiguity. Well, oftentimes for us, if a field was on the wrong type, it's because we had it living on that node instead of on the edge and, or that connection type. So naturally, this became our guideline of expose relational data on relational types. Once we moved fields to these types, both our schema and our queries made a lot more sense. And lastly, don't rely on query path. Well, this one's pretty straightforward. Became our consider multiple query paths. So it's all of these lessons that turned into these guidelines, and we hope that you can take them and use them to better represent data models in your schema. Thank you so much for coming to our talk. Please give us feedback using the link on the slide. And we have our emails on the next slide if you want to reach out. Go forth and build clear schemas. <laughs> yeah.